Uh, welcome to my talk today on container orchestration and Kubernetes. You guys have probably heard at least that word before, maybe in the context of cloud computing or modern deployment strategies. And uh, I want to teach you more about it. So what is Kubernetes? Well, it's an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Thank you for coming to my talk today. <laughs> no. Uh, but in order to talk about what Kubernetes is, we need to talk about containers. And in order to talk about containers, we have to talk about virtualization. And in order to talk about that, I need to ask you guys a question. What is a web application? What is a web application? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> An application that runs on the web. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Defines two key features, right? Functionality. It's an application. And it's on the web. It lives somewhere where the user is not. So two aspects. We have a client, we'll call her Kate, and we have a server, a computer that sits somewhere away from our clients. But of course, modern web applications, even web applications at the beginning were a little bit more complex than that, right? You might have a database, you might, fetch from some external APIs. You might have a whole bunch of infrastructure, things like load balancers and uh, services, microservices, DNSs and CDNs that really modularize your application and serve it across maybe hundreds of different computers around the world. So how do we achieve this? And how do we think of a web application if it sort of lives everywhere? Well, let's talk a little bit about the history of deploying web applications. Deployment is just maybe a, a fancy word for saying how we serve it to our clients and where these applications live. So in the beginning, we were in this era of physical servers. Generally speaking, one application on one physical machine, what we might call bare, bare metal. Really easy to organize, really simple to think about, but not great at utilizing our resources as appropriately as we might hope. You know, if you have a web application, a single web application, it's very unlikely it's going to be able to utilize 100% of that server's resources. In fact, some estimates say on these bare metal servers, at least in these 70s, 80s, 90s era, only 6 to 10% of the resources you were putting in to you know, building a server went towards the application you were serving on it. Can we do better? Yeah. Takes us to the era of virtual machines. Virtual machines are virtualized servers. And what do I mean by virtual? Well, virtualization is the process of taking hardware, like your server, its CPU, its memory, its storage, and turning those physical resources into software that can be called upon, right? I can separate my machine, my machine by memory and I can allocate memory to different virtual machines that sit on top of that bare metal. The technology that accomplishes this is called a hypervisor. Hypervisor is actually as old as the 1970s, but it's only more recently in the 2000s that we were able to, 90s and 2000s, that we were able to sort of segment these uh, servers that we had the resources to segment them into multiple, multiple virtual machines, each of which can serve an application, but also each of which needs its own OS, something like a Linux or uh, a PC that you would actually, or Windows, excuse me, that you would actually have to pay for and you would have to install, right? It would take up memory. It would take up some of those resources. We see some duplication of things we don't need. Lord knows you don't need all of Microsoft to serve your Hello World application. But in the era of virtual machines, you would need that. So can we do even better? By the way, this, this picture is just something I thought was funny, kind of looks like a virtual machine, but it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, we can do better. Modern day, we have containers. Rather than entire virtual machines, entire virtualized computers, Containers are really, really lightweight environments 
that just serve the purpose of serving our application and isolating it off from the larger computer. Notice we don't have the OS anymore. These containers also need their own engine to run them. So when you put in a command like Docker run, the Docker daemon, this engine layer, can make sure that container is spun up and run. So just to compare and contrast for a second between these eras of virtual machines in our modern day, you can see containers, they, they start up really quickly. It allows us to have these microservices that just spin up for, for seconds and then die again. Of course, a container's runtime, a container's life cycle is tied to the application it runs. Also, containers allow for almost no overhead. The smallest container can be megabytes, whereas the smallest virtual machine would be gigabytes often. 500 megabytes was the smallest one I could even find. So what does that enable us to do? Well, having these lightweight containers allows us to build microservices in our application. It allows us to spread our application out to the world where each container can live on separate servers all over the place, each serving a single purpose. That gets us our modern day Googles and Facebooks. But what's the issue here? Well, the network is incredibly complex. Trying to connect these different machines together, these different containerized services is incredibly difficult. What if a service, what if a container, excuse me, dies or an application starts running? How do you ensure that your network stays the same? This is sometimes called Death Star architecture. It maps the uh, network connections for Amazon's microservices in about 2008 when they had about 500 microservices. Now they've got many more. How do you keep that network going? Well, enter Kubernetes. So, what is Kubernetes? Well, let's start off by saying it was invented by Google. It was generated from an internal tool they had called uh, Borg. that They started with in about 2006 to run their own internal servers. But in 2015, it was donated as an open source product to the Cloud Native Foundation. So it's open source. You or I can download it and play with the source code. If you've ever heard K8S, that's just K eight letters and S, it's just nerd talk. <laughs> and so what is Kubernetes? It's an open source system for automating deployment, scaling and management of containerized applications. But let's actually try to understand what that looks like. So a Kubernetes cluster is sort of a representation of all the resources and all the infrastructure present in your application. You've got these different nodes, which represent either virtualized or physical servers. And on those nodes, we wrap these containers we were talking about earlier in what Kubernetes calls pods. Pods are sort of a proxy that keep the connection going between these containers and the rest of your network. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But let's first talk about the brain of the operation. The control plane. This is you, by the way. If you only remember one thing from this lecture, the thing you should remember is that containers, uh, excuse me, Kubernetes works with desired state management. The entire idea behind Kubernetes is desired state management. You tell Kubernetes, hey, I want this many machines in my system. I have this many containers running and this many pods to proxy those containers. I have this much duplication of my resources. And if a server goes down, the control plane will make sure, hey, we'll build that server back up. We'll build that node back up. Whatever you tell it your application should look like from an infrastructure standpoint, it'll maintain that desired state. A couple of things to just point out in this control node really quickly. The ETCD is a key value storage. This is the memory, which says, hey, Someone told me I need to have three different node ones in my application, three different servers running, I don't know, an ordering application. And what ETC do, it'll keep those three pods running, even if one of them dies, those three nodes, excuse me, run. The controller manager is going to sort of monitor 
the nodes and the infrastructure throughout your application. And the scheduler is going to schedule the life and death cycles of your different nodes. That's a control point node. You submit an apt out YAML file, which says, hey, give me three copies of this one server. Make sure they're running these different pods. And no matter what, even if the server farm bur burns down, Kubernetes will find a way to ensure those resources are maintained. The worker nodes is the other side of this application. So why do they wrap these containers we were talking about earlier in an additional abstraction in pods? Well. The idea is if a container dies, if it stops running, that container would disappear and all networking to that container would go away. So the helpful part of wrapping it in a pod is I can keep the same address, the same ISP to connect to this pod to access the functionality that's contained in the container. And all Kubernetes needs to do is spin up a new version of that container. That way, when I have this massive network with hundreds of containers going in and out of service, my mapping doesn't need to change. That's the basic idea between, but, uh, behind Kubernetes. The kubelet process is sort of the boss of this worker node. The kube processes is gonna maintain those network connections and the container runtime would be something like Docker, which you've maybe downloaded on your local desktop to spin up and run these containers. So why use Kubernetes? Well, the first idea is this desired state management. And just to reiterate one more time, the idea is you want your application infrastructure to look like this. You don't have to run to a container every time one dies or a server goes down to make sure those resources are allocated appropriately. Kubernetes will maintain that state for you. It conserves high availability. And no downtime, no matter what, it'll maintain those resources in place. Scalability, you can insert rules to make sure your applications and resources grow with scale. And disaster recovery and avoidance because it's maintaining that application state the entire time. Also, every company you want to work for uses Kubernetes, like all of them. And more importantly, Google does. The whole marketing from the beginning of Kubernetes is that it was used to run Google's internal infrastructure. We all know how complex that is. So it makes you trust the Kubernetes system quite a bit if you know it's able to spin up and maintain something as complex as Google. Okay, so what are the downsides? Well, more than anything else, it's complexity. This is not meant, Kubernetes is not intended for you building one application on your local machine. It's not even intended for the one or two servers you use for your one or two services or your one or two backend endpoints. It's meant for incredibly complex, large applications at scale that need repeat servers in Asia and America and South America to make sure nothing goes down, even if a server farm burns up. It can allocate those resources to the right place. Okay, so, so what is Kubernetes? Yeah, it's an open source for automating yada yada. But how I really think about it, how I want you to think about it, is that it's where modern web applications live. So the same way you might look at a server you know, back in the 90s and say, somewhere in there is my code running. Now you might look at your Kubernetes cluster or look at a Kubernetes dashboard and say, I can see the entire infrastructure that runs my application. Here's my work cited. Thanks so much for coming today. If you want to talk about containers or <laughs> infrastructure or the cloud, please reach out to me on any of my socials. Thanks, guys.